Bobby and Dad show, we go to Old Fort Henry for a firing demonstration. service. This is the longest used one on the rack. It is a smooth forward uh, muzzle loading weapon. So similar to the uh, uh, field or the ordnance up on the wall. It's just as smooth on the outside or on the inside as it is on the outside and it's loaded from the muzzle. Uh, it is a flintlock musket which means that this hammer piece back, back then would have had a piece of flint inside of it uh, which the size of the hammer could be adjusted based on the flint you were issued. So if it was the thicker piece, you could adjust the screw size so it could be bigger. Or if it was thinner, you could screw it down so it could be smaller. Now how you would load it, you would take a paper cartridge from either your ball bag or your cartouche, tear it open with your two front teeth. Having your two front teeth was a dental requirement in the British infantry. If you did not have them, you could not join. You tear, you spit, and then you pour the powder into the flash pan is right there. Can you all see that? I'll uh, walk, just give you guys a quick glance. You can see that right there. So you pour that in, then you'd close the frizzin, which is this little piece here. So that way when you flip the barrel around, the powder doesn't, sp the powder doesn't spill on the ground, which is gonna be very important in a second. You pour the rest of the shot in. This includes the rest of the powder, the wadding, and most importantly, the musket ball, which would be at the end of the cartridge. Once that's down, you would use your ramrod, and then you would ram it down and pack the shot in. The reason I'm using my two fingers yeah. and not my entire hand is mm. that in the event that the powder goes off prematurely and sets off the round, I'm only going to lose my two fingers <laughs> and not my entire hand. So assuming you haven't blown part of your hand off yet, or if you weren't paying attention, your entire hand, uh, you'd screw the ramrod back into place so you don't lose it when you go up to fire. You go to the full cock and then you'd wait for your fire command. Uh, depending on whether, where you are, where you were in the rank, you'd either be at the front rank firing position or the rear rank firing position. And depending on which rank you were in, you'd either be called front rank fire or rear rank fire. If you were in the rear rank in this case, you'd wait and then everyone in the rear rank would go up and then fire. The ensuing spark that would have been caused by the flint striking the prison would have set off the powder in the flash pan, which would set off the powder in the barrel because there's a tiny bold board alongside where the flash pan is, which set off the powder, sending the musket ball home. Now, the reason it was used for so long, up until 1853, so as you can imagine, pretty much almost over 150 years, used for two primary reasons. Number one, it was a relatively easy weapon to manufacture en masse at a relatively cheap cost, and also it was easy to teach the common soldier how to fire, how to load and fire a musket. Um, but there were some flaws with the weapon. Number one, due to the loading procedure, especially the first half, if it was raining out, uh, it would be very weather soluble. So let's say it's raining and I'm pouring exposed gunpowder into the flash pan. If any water comes into contact with the powder grain, it'll turn into a black gunky substance similar to that of tar, which means it will not go off. So no matter what kind of heat source I put next to it, I can't detonate the weapon. Which means even if I pour the rest of the shot in and do the rest of the loading procedure perfectly, it won't work. Another issue is due to the way, due to the fact that it's a smoothbore weapon and uh, there is nothing to grip the round, and given that the round is spherical, its range and accuracy is quite poor. You're looking at 100 yards of effective range, and because it's a smoothboard weapon, the ball would rattle around on the inside so it wouldn't travel in a straight line. So if I'm trying to hit the door over there, even though it's well within my effective range, there's still a good chance I might miss. So even if I do hit the door, it's not going to be the part that I was aiming for in the first place. And if I do hit it, it's a stroke of luck. Uh, there's also just as good a chance I might hit the window instead, which is why we would fire in volleys instead of independently, so you can maximize your chance of hitting. And that's why when everyone was using muskets, we'd fight in line because that way you could actually 
hit your target to spread out your rate of fire. Whereas if you had a bunch of people scattered about independently, fights would probably have lasted for weeks uh, before any conclusive end was uh, met. Um, another issue is the actual loading time of the weapon. You're looking at two to three shots per minute for the average soldier. And for the average recruit, the shot rate would be lowered to about one to two. And that's assuming no mistakes are made through the entire loading process. Because for instance, if the ramrod came flying out, or what a mistake some soldiers made, is that they often would forget to take, take it out, yeah. the ramrod out when they went to fire, yeah. which is essentially called going off at half cock. Uh, uh, so now their ramrod would be about, about 90 yards away, maybe 100 yards off in the distance and they'd have to go and get it or get a replacement one and in the heat of combat that's not just something you can just do so um, assuming they didn't make mistakes like that uh, it would cost you about 30 seconds if you just dropped it so it was a very unreliable weapon when it came to loading time now the Navy infantry the British Empire issued an upgrade to all the infantrymen which is the Enfield rifle now as opposed to a musket, it is a rifle, meaning that similar to the field gun, there is a rifling that actually grips the round. And because we're not using bullets instead of musket balls, it already travels through the air at a much smoother pace because it actually because the spin actually cuts the wind, which makes it travel in a straighter line. And the rifling helps aid that process. So the range of this weapon is 400 yards as opposed to 100 yards. And because of the rifling, it travels in a straight line is very reliable, which is why we actually have near sights now instead of just far sights. So we have both near and far sights, which means you can effectively skirmish with this weapon. Whereas before, uh, rifle regiments would have had flintlock weapons and they could only get two shots per minute due to how unreliable that was, but at least they had skirmishers. But now everyone could effectively skirmish, and instead of having flintlock systems, we'd have a percu hammer and percussion cap system. So the first tap again, light spit pour. Now because there's rifling, you do have to twist the round in, because you can't just muscle the round all the way down, because if you try to push it and force it, the bullet can get stuck on the rifling. So you have to twist it in so it actually grips. But once it's down, twist the ramrod back up, secure it, and then if I was going to fire this weapon, I'd have a series of percussion caps along my cartouche strap. I'd put one on the end of the barrel here, and then I'd go to the full cock, and then the hammer striking down on the percussion cap would set off a concealed charge inside, which would then set off the powder in the barrel, sending the bullet home. Now, the only issue that was left, because we've addressed the water solubility a bit by getting rid of the flintlock system so that the powder is no longer exposed, as well as the range and accuracy of the weapon by making a very accurate rifle, but there's still the issue of loading time. And during the 1860s, shortly after we issued this weapon to the infantrymen of the British Empire, uh, the American Civil War was going on, uh, and at this time they were making breech-loading weapons that loaded from the back instead of the muzzle. And because Great Britain was very paranoid about another American invasion of British North America, as well as seeing some of their other rivals in Europe making similar advancements, they were getting very nervous. So, because they had just spent a bunch of money upgrading their soldiers w with these new weapons, they looked for a shortcut utilizing that weapon that they already have, and then just modifying it a bit. So they looked to independent designers to come up with a modification. And ironically, they chose the design of an American designer to help curb their paranoia about American invasion. And they took the designs of one Jacob Snyder, a Dutch American wine merchant out of Philadelphia, and they made the Snyder Enfield rifle. So from here down, it's essentially the same weapon, both in terms of range, accuracy, and water solubility, but then we get the loading procedure here. It's a little different. This is a breech block, so what you would do, go to the half cock, you would take a cartridge out. So instead of pouring in the round now, all we have to do is just put in the concealed round, close, go up, fire, and then extract, and then load again. This brought up the rate of fire from two to three shots to about 10 to 12 shots per minute, which was a like significant improvement, which allowed us to, instead of do what's called volley firing, to now do file firing, which instead of firing first rank and then second rank, you would fire two front ranks at the end of the line, would fire, and then their rear ranks would fire. And then the front ranks next to them would fire, and then the rear ranks would fire. Then they'd work their way to the middle, and then start again, and then again, and then again, and then again, and then again, sometimes mid-chain. So you'd have four to six rifles up at a time, and constantly. So instead of 
uh, instead of having a volley fire, pause, volley fire, pause, you would have a consistent stream of bullets flying towards the enemy so they'd have no reprieve, mm. as it were. Definitely. And the smaller weapon is a variant of the Snyder Enfield rifle. It is the Snyder Enfield carbine. This is the artillery variant, and it's specifically utilized for the uh, field guns here. So two of these each would be stored on the backs of the limber box there. Also, every artillery sergeant would have one of their own out in the field. And in the event the artillery crews ever came under attack, two of the gunners could take up arms as well and help defend the gun crews while they could still load and fire. Uh, does anyone have any questions before I fire off the Snyder Enfield rifle a few times? Yes. Yeah, you, um, <clears throat> there's two uh, rifles that you didn't uh, mention. I'm wondering maybe they didn't use it uh, at the fort. One is the uh, the Baker rifle that was used by the 95th rifle, but also yeah. the Fencibles in Canada. The other rifle is the Minier rifle that was used in the Crimean War. Specifically because for the average infantryman, unless they were in the rifle divisions they right. had back then that were specifically for skirmishing units, they right. wouldn't have seen those unless they came in. Because we didn't have any rifle regiments yet until... 1867 like overall right because, oh sorry until 1853 with the Enfields because you know we did have the Baker rifles it's just that um, they were utilized by the Green Jackets the, the skirmish with the Green Jackets and for defensive fortifications like this they usually if they had skirmishers they would be out of the fort um, right unless we were unless we were uh, aware of an imminent attack on us we wouldn't have them here um, so that's the best answer I can give you. And what was the other one? The Minier rifle that was used during the Crimean, but I guess that never left the uh, Europe because no, it was yeah, a that, that, it was a French specific, rifle, I think. Yeah, yeah. specifically for that uh, purpose. Uh, is there another question? There was another, uh, no. Okay. So just some safety warnings. Uh, similar to the uh, Armstrong, uh, the explosion can be quite loud, so you may want to cover your ears. Uh, if any cartridges roll towards you, do not pick them up, please. Uh, I will get them. And then last but not least, do not cross the white rope barrier. I'm also going to quickly show this. Uh, each of the infantrymen would have this socket bayonet, which would be utilized to help fend off against cavalry if so, when we're forming square, or if the enemy's coming at us in close range. But also skirmishers would have them affixed in the event that they had to get into close quarters immediately. Which is the position I'm going to take up right about now. Okay. Because that was, for a while, that was pretty much the best firing method they had was the flintlock, which is why sideburns were almost a mandatory if you could grow them. But then by the time we get to the percussion cap system, that became less of a problem because we didn't no longer we no longer had explosions going off right next to our bases. But mm. uh, for a very long time, yeah. Would they have been using uh, the Enfield and the Brown Bess uh, overlapping because of a lack of uh, arms, let's say? Um, perhaps for the first couple months, but... yeah. At, at that time, the British Empire was pretty good at... It would just depend on where, in some locations probably, but um, in places where they were worried about imminent invasions more so. Like, for instance, Canada, or British North America, they were very paranoid about that kind of thing. So we got the Enfields very quickly, as well as most of their most of their holdings in mainland Europe and also in, in uh, Hindustan. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, yeah, it would be a little slower in other places. Uh, but yeah. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to hand it off the next demonstration.